Right, um, everybody, um, and I'm hoping that everybody is actually watching today because um, there will be a test at the end. And um, anyway, I'm John Atak, and this is Casey. I don't know the rest of your name even. This is that's an interesting story, actually, John, uh, because I don't share my last name publicly or on Very the good. podcast, so it's so uh, by design cool. and it's worked. <laughs> Excellent. This is Casey Anonymous. Uh, from the Cult Vault. So um, tell me a little bit about, you know, what brought you to creating the Cult Vault and what it is, maybe. Well, thank you, first of all, for for inviting me to come and chat with you today, John. I'm really excited. I'm a uh, um, an avid reader of different books, and I've now finished two of yours. And uh, the subject of Scientology I think is an endless well of uh, interesting information and you definitely give people a lot of that. So thank you so much for inviting me today. The Cult Vault podcast is a, a long format interview based show where I speak with a different cult survivor each week. Oh. So sometimes we might be talking about um, a, a specific identified cult. Sometimes we might be talking about a situation where someone has experienced high levels of coercive control. And sometimes we might be talking about high demand religious groups. We've talked about the armed forces. There's lots of different elements to the show and it's not restricted to what um, people might typically associate with the word cult if you are not somebody that has looked at the different varying definitions of the term that exist. In my mind, I feel like everybody I speak to has their own definition of what that word means. So it's not restricted to the, the traditional term cult that we understand it as in this day and age, but we do talk about cult-like things in everyday life. Um, sometimes there are experts and authors um, and sometimes they're the same, <laughs> which is nice. Um, and uh, we highlight different authors' books on the show and just just chat to people about their various experiences. It's uh, every every interview is an education and I absolutely love it. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I found it, I started doing this four years ago, um, next month, that we started trying to record things. And um, it it's added a, a new dimension to, to my life because it's forced me to speak with people I really like frequently and, and, and then publish that and so we, we've now got about 400 videos wow. and, and the conversations are fascinating that that there are always insights everybody alive has some insight and knows something that I don't know and has some perspective that that's useful to me on the question of this word this dreadful c word um it's I, I you know I, I've been for it and against it and and around and about it and it i if if we could just go back to its original definition um which is is pretty much a, a, a an individual a group or a doctrine that somebody is dedicated to and so we had the cult of jesus which is called christianity it's not a pejorative word but unfortunately um and i trace this down i got very interested in this the, the last um, new usage, new definition in the Oxford Dictionary was from 1711. And it's pretty much what I've just said. So the negative definition comes from the American Heritage Dictionary in the 1890s, where somebody decided, probably Merriam Webster or somebody, that, that this ought to be a nasty thing. And then in the 1970s, when the term was being used by the News of the World and other august media bodies, um, and a variety of sociologists who started being paid by what they called new religious movements to uh, report on their activities and not necessarily declaring their interest by saying they've been paid, they started to object to this word. Uh, and for me, you know, I remember when I first met Steve Hassan, which was back in 1989, before you were born, and um, he said, oh, we've got to put the word destructive or dangerous in front of the word cult. And I agreed thoroughly. And the years slipped by and we both stopped doing that. 
and I've come to the perspective that, that what I'm really bothered about is not whether something's a cult and people, you know, year in, year out, come up to me and say, is my son in a cult? Is my friend in a cult? And I'm going, are they being harmed? Whether, you know, how, what word we use to define the group doesn't matter. And is the group authoritarian? Is it telling them what to do? Is it prohibiting them from um, associating with other people? Is it saying you can't say these things, you can't think these things? Because in that case, it's authoritarian. And, you know, that has, there are two ends to that spectrum. One is the authoritarian leader, leader the person who believes that they are God incarnate and know exactly what to do in the world and can bully us and tell us what to do. These are otherwise known as politicians um, in, in many cases. We've all had enough of experts, as Michael Gove put it, and I've had enough of him long since. Uh, Dominic Cummings, by the way, was his expert at that time, which is an interesting thought, isn't it, given what happened? But uh, people who don't believe in expertise, who don't believe in science, who don't believe in evidence, who believe in the strength of their own opinions, their feelings of knowing, their sense of certainty, and lord it above, or I suppose, let's not be sexist, lord it or lady it above us all. Um, those are the authoritarian leaders, or bullies, as I like to think of them. And then you have the authoritarian followers. And I think that's the real problem. The majority of people, we so readily grant authority to others and and follow um you know their prescription and their prescriptions whether it's neoconservatism or neoliberalism or you know um being a wokeness or, or you know all of these things that say this is the way you've got to think this is the way you've got to behave the demand for purity as robert j lifton called it they're authoritarian and i don't like them and so that's that's I've moved my focus. So at the cult vault, you're doing exactly that. You're looking at cultish groups. You're looking at authoritarian groups and um, shining a light, you know, which very definitely needs to be done. It's an interesting journey that I've been through in terms of my understanding of that whole concept that you've that you've just kind of uh, unpacked uh, for us, and it's that. It, well, it was kind of like a Dunning-Kruger thing for me because I'd watched a few documentaries, so I knew everything there was to know about the subject. <laughs> and then I read a memoir by a lady named Helen Zuman, who spent a significant amount of time on Zendik Farm. And she'd written a book named Mating in Captivity. And I read her book and I was like, wow, this is... there's so much more to this subject than I'd ever comprehended. Mm. You know, you you... I read a news article about the sex cult at Zendik Farm and I called it a sex cult to Helen and she very quickly told me that it wasn't a sex cult. It was um, a cult with a radical take on sex and relationships and there's a big difference between those two things. And now I watch documentaries. There's a documentary about the Sarah Lawrence cult that comes out soon from Hulu and they focus on the aspects of sexual coercion within the group but it's not the main focus even though it's been labeled as a sex cult by various media outlets so my intention in terms of reporting or discussing certain groups and environments is yes the children of god had a lot of doctrine based around sexual intercourse and intergenerational intercourse yes. but how did we get to that place in the first place is really important so it's kind of like gathering the entire picture from first generation members and saying how did how did you become so involved what tactics and methods were used against you that then this was able to then happen with the children I think that's so pivotal in my own understanding to then be able to unpack the the really abusive things that happen inside really insulated groups like the children of god and the same with nexium there was you know the inner circle of dos but how you get to that point in the first place is looking at the manipulation that took place with all the other members that were involved in nexium um into the inner circle um and i don't use the term cult specifically uh, because i try not to put too much of my own opinion into interviews and conversations with people um 
if the if the person that I'm speaking with would like to use that word for a group they've been a part of, of course, that's absolutely their right. And I think there's a lot of power that people can take back from using a term uh, that is pejorative like cults, especially if they have experienced excessive trauma and abuse. But uh, I also recognize that there's a chance I might be sued um, for using that term against any specific group. So there is also like a, a, a litigious um, reason for me not to say, oh, today we're going to be talking about the cult of X, Y, Z. <laughs> well, speaking as somebody who has been sued <laughs> and uh, fairly frequently, um, and not for a long time, thankfully, I, my litigation all closed in 2000. But I, I use the I've never been sued for using the word cult, and I, I think there'd be deep trouble. That there was a, an anonymous protest against Scientology a few years ago, and a 15-year-old boy was arrested by the Metropolitan Police, bless them, who every 10 years have to lose 10% of their members because the Metropolitan Police are a cult. Go on, sue me. Um, but the Metropolitan Police arrested this boy because he got a placard saying that Scientology was a cult. And then it was pointed out to them that this word is not pejorative, and as much as they would like to rein in hate speech, they had no mandate whatsoever. I mean, so I I don't think, but I, I take what, what you're saying, that there are some litigious groups. Scientology, of course, is the most litigious group in all of history. It has That's fun. absolutely wild. Is, the, is this the, the last time that you were had legal action taken against you? Was it from Scientology? Oh, it's... it's um, it's almost always been from Scientology. Uh, the, in fact, there's only one of the case, and that was by an ex-Scientologist. So, um, and who'd gone to the court and suggested that I'd used undue influence, I'd used mind control, which given that, you know, it's like accusing a doctor of, of, of you know, giving you a disease. It, you know, only, no, it's, it's not. It, it, it's a ridiculous situation because there I am telling people, exactly how this works so if i were using it then it, it would be rather obvious you know but that is like a, a a difficult thing to unweave though isn't it if you're if you're say you're an officer at the police station and someone comes in and says this man who claims to be able to tell me if i'm being manipulated or not is manipulating me i think that that for somebody um perhaps on the outside of the situation would be like how do i even know what is happening here <laughs> and and it is true that, that a variety, variety of leaders of destructive cults um have actually you know their ma manifesto is that they are un, you know ron hubbard in from from the outset had said he was undoing hypnosis and he was undoing it by doing it. <laughs> it's sort of, hmm, okay. I do oh. see recently in a lot of um, new age influencers online that use a lot of kind of mysticism um, and esotericism in their supposed teachings where they offer extortionate subscription fees to predominantly middle-aged women um with either young kids or kids that have left home uh is that they are adding segments on their websites that say um were you part of a family cult i can tell you the people that can't tell you dr stephen hassan he is a con artist and then it's just like loads of uh reasons as to why you can't trust the teachings of stephen hassan and then lists lists things like he has been taken to court for you know for this that and the other and it, these are the cults that are taking him to court because they don't want him talking about them in the cult parameters so you can't even use those as as genuine <laughs> as, but but yeah that, that's being used to discredit his work so I think that is another layer of manipulation that individuals are starting to add to their their yeah arsenal online um and the online phenomenon is a is a whole other uh is a whole other ball game i think you you mentioned authoritarian followers and i think when we look at situations like QAnon and we try to ascertain how an unorganized group can cause so much harm and create and generate so many followers 
there are so many authoritarian followers of a group that doesn't really have an identified leader that that's able to really happen uh, and and spread like wildfire across the internet because you can find people with your exact interests likes dislikes um on the internet whereas in real life i think it's a lot harder to find somebody that specifically likes to play you know a a, a really niche card game that you grew yeah, up with playing <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah but i feel like you can find any any people on the internet uh, if you oh, yeah. look Hopefully. hard enough um yeah. so it's tough it's a tough one and and let me draw together some of those strands. Um, yes, please. This is this is what I've been waiting for all day. <laughs> last year, last year, Steve, Doctor Stephen Hassan and I published, co-authored a, a, a piece that, that was in an Oxford University Press book called "Lone Act of Terrorism." And the reason they came to us is because we have, for some time, been saying the peril now is the internet, and it traces back to the concept of leaderless resistance. Leaderless resistance was put forward, I think it's 1963, early 60s, by a retired US Army colonel who was positive that the communists were going to take America over. And so he wanted people not to join together as he had you know, some experience of intelligence. He understood that if you make groups, then as soon as you find one member of the group, you've got them all. So what you do is you put forward this idea and people just go and do it. This came into a horrible reality with Al-Qaeda, where people would look at their material online, not connect with them in any way, and go and blow something up or stab somebody as a consequence of that. We're now seeing the, the concept going all the way through the internet. So, I mean, probably the, the first serious negative example of, of leaderless res resistance is um, the Turner Diaries um, by William Pierce. And I had the tremendous pleasure of interviewing his son, Calvin, um, who wrote a wonderful book called The Sins of My Father, um, which is a horrifying account of the barbarous lifestyle of, of America's um, supreme nazi as as william pierce was for a while the uh, founder of the church of the cosmo creator if we want to talk about religious cults um and timothy mcveigh is the first example of, of you know the oklahoma city bombings which until 9 11 was the largest um fatality of any terrorist event in in the americas um he used to read the Turner Diaries and go to gun fairs and, and sell it to people at cost price. Uh, this book has now sold more than half a million copies. And so you have this, the idea goes out there. And so if we look at Colton, what we said before, that you have a, a leader, a group, or a doctrine. And this is the thing that's fascinated me for some years now, this idea that people can just adopt a doctrine and then, then do crazy things in consequence of their belief in this doctrine. And the doctrine itself will be, it'll be because it makes them feel that this should be what they're doing. It's not because there's evidence to support an idea. I think we do see a lot of this in politics, I'm afraid, where people adopt you know, economic ideas, which like austerity, for example, in this country, which it, it, there's nothing to support this as a workable way of approaching the world. So a doctrine, a dogma, you know, becomes, you know, the, Again, Robert J. Lifton, the demand for purity then sets in and people are going, well, we've got to live by this doctrine. You know, when um, Margaret Thatcher um, came to power, she assembled a cabinet and she put a copy of The Road to Serfdom by von Hayek on the desk and said, this is our Bible. So, if, you know, what a bizarre way to look at politics to say, you know, we've now got to conform to these ideas, which are untried, untested and come you know, they're hypothetical ideas, they're interesting ideas, but they're hypothetical. And in the same way, um, we've seen terrorism become, a, a full, you know, we now have religious and non-religious terrorism. Um, I, I don't agree with Richard Dawkins, who made a public statement in the 1990s that terrorism was completely driven by religion. By that time, 
as far as I could tell, there had been about 900 suicide bombings, and he blamed them all on religion. Half of them were by secular groups, um, you know, like the Tamil Tigers or Sendero Luminoso, or uh, no religious affiliation, even in, in Palestine, the Al-Aqsa Brigades and what have you. So he, he, he'd absorbed a doctrine which said this is, and he was certain that this, and we have to be, we have to have a certain degree of humility if we can manage it. I find it hard, I must say, but we we need to to look at things and say, is there more evidence? Is there a better way of looking at this? To what extent are we simply blindly following ideas because they seem to make sense? So um, also to comment on, you know, Steve is not facing any litigation at the moment. <laughs> I talk with Steve every week um, and he hasn't been sued for years. So anybody that's saying that is making it up. Um, that entire thing is is um it's one of those situations that you read a sentence and you kind of turn your head so fast it gives you whiplash because yeah. this this individual she claims to be able to heal family wounds uh ancestral family wounds and and heal you from parental narcissistic abuse which individuals that find this woman may may well have experienced but, but she identifies cult, uh, a cult family as something a little bit different as to perhaps uh, how you uh, and I might define it. I'm and sure then also does. says she's the only person that can heal you of of the, the wounds sustained mm. from a family cult. Um, and if you are to look at the work of, of Dr. Stephen Hassan, for example, um, it's all ineffectual and... It, it, yeah, somebody even said, somebody even commented on one of the things and said he's not peer reviewed, and I was like, I'm pretty sure he's very peer reviewed. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, um, I mean, he has yeah, a he has a doctorate, you know, from the Fielding Institute, so uh, it, it's real. Um, and it, it, this smacks of um, Stephen Molyneux and Free Domain Radio, and this this concept that all families are cults. And therefore, the best thing you can do is to drop any contact with your own family. And having dealt with a couple of people over the years, you know, this one woman came to me and her 17-year-old had just left a note on the pillow. Um, I'm gone. You know, I'm now a follower of Stephen Molyneux. Um, Sounds very similar to the, to this, uh, what, what this lady is selling. Uh, mm. If it's young children, they're being encouraged to be taken out of public school and homeschooled and not be given access to any vaccines um, and to not uh, be allowed to communicate with uh, children in the neighborhood. So, you know, you recognize here hallmarks of, of control. But then if you don't have any dependents, then you should divorce your spouse, um, stop contacting people in your family because you have been abused and the only way that you can heal from that is to move away into a safe state and give this woman all of your money. Oh, give me her address. So, you know, I don't yeah. have her money, but she can have it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. But but I, I think um, what, what I find the most interesting thing about this subject is that you can you can follow the information back to people that are recycling other people's ideas and it all overlaps and somebody said it's like it's like cult leaders have um some space on the dark web where they all meet up each week and and share like oh maybe this week we should try this and we should try that because you feel like you can you can see you know i, I saw a brilliant chart a scientology chart the other day and it was all of the influences that L. Ron Hubbard took from other things and then it is said in a big bubble Scientology and underneath it all of the things that have been influenced by L. Ron Hubbard and mm. it was so fascinating to look at because you could absolutely see just on paper there are parts of this and this and this in Scientology mm. and there are parts of Scientology in this and this and this and I was like wow I'm sure it's a lot more extensive than that but even on paper you can you can see those links and, uh, and and what opening our minds did so well was to trace things back and say, this is where this came from. This is how this started. Earliest evidence would suggest that, you know, in terms, especially in terms of consumerism and advertising, because that's something that's been plaguing me and stressing me out for a little while, um, because I know I'm being influenced, even if I'm trying really hard to not 
allow myself to be influenced so um and I was like does anyone else feel this way and then there's a whole chapter in your book and I was like okay I feel a little bit better now <laughs> oh good well you know I'll give you my address and you can send me the check with all your okay. money and we'll see what we can oh do. sorry was that the hard sell you sent me the book for free and now I yeah okay okay yeah That's I'm with you. Very, very called, well done it's called foot in the door in the uh, psychological literature give something for free and then it's it's the way you know google and facebook and all of these things came along and came to control our lives completely because we trusted the evil people that uh, like mark zuckerberg who founded them um you know we now know that that it was very deliberate on their part that they're yeah, there's a playbook. I'd be very interested to see whatever it was you saw, because because I haven't seen that particular thing. And the it, it I think it you know when I first started digging into this, which is nearly forty years ago now, um, reading everything I could get, it started to become apparent to me that 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 what we're dealing with is not how human psychology is manipulated, but what human psychology is. So it's not that these sets of techniques and hundreds and hundreds of techniques and different ways of doing this. No, we are manipulated in very simple ways. So, for example, um, if you read, I think it's David Maurer, he, his work on con artists, uh, to which the movie The Sting came. Um, he says that in interviewing, and he was a linguist who was interested in the idiomatic language of con artists in the 30s, 40s, 50s, what have you in the US. And he became friendly with these people and they started telling him things. And one of the very simple things is con artists rely on, on one thing, greed. There you go, the, the, the grifter, the, the uh, flim flam man, the bunker, we got such great words for this, that, that you want something for nothing and they'll say, we'll give it to you. And as he points out, people will, who've been stung will actually go back to be stung again by the same person because it's you know the setup guy who brought them in is blamed and they'll put up another ten thousand dollars because they're greedy and that's a fundamental idea then you have the sense of belonging we we want to be belong we want to be part of a, of a social group and many groups offer that when you get to hubbard i, I wrote a oh, 30 years ago, I wrote a paper called um, Possible Origins for Dianetics and Scientology, one of my more flamboyant titles, I think. <laughs> and it, it, it came about because I was, was hired in a court case uh, in California by a man called Frank Sarge Gabodi. And he um, splintered from Scientology. He's, he's a psychiatrist, you know, whole thing. And 14 years he was in Scientology. And then he left and he set up an independent Scientology thing, which became the Institute for Research into Metapsychology. And um, to my shame, it's me that gave him the word metapsychology. And because um, I, I used to sort of defend the independent Scientologists from the mother cult. And um, but he came to me and he said that he, he basically sued Scientology um, on the grounds that they'd uh, persuaded the American Psychological Association not to give degree credits for studying Scientology with him, metapsychology. So you could get degree credits for studying Scientology. Oh, I'm saying, my goodness. Said, Sarge, you, you, you said in your book that, you know, so they'd gone along and said, look, he's just plagiarized Ron Hubbard. And um, I said, but Sarge, he says very clearly in, in the introduction to your book that, that the techniques come from Hubbard. And Sarge said, um, yeah, that was the first edition. <laughs> and so the only choice I felt I had was was to show that Hubbard had plagiarized the ideas. So they had no. You know, wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. poem. So I wrote this paper and 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 it, it turned out and I was quite surprised at this, that most of the ideas you can actually trace to Alistair Crowley. Yes. Yeah. I I've, well, I've been dipping in and out of, of Chris Shelton's uh youtube videos mm -hmm. and i've heard bits of that i did a a patreon series on the satanic panic um mm. and it was about 12 episodes long and in order to understand the crescendo that happened in the 80s 
I had to go all the way back to Alistair Crowley and Madame Blavatsky and I had to look at Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan and all the little bits that added to the 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 big kind of panic that unfolded in the 80s and still exists today and actually is coming back in a full swing which is a whole other thing it's erupted but, in um, Holland it's, it is it is going there's just been an inquiry in Holland and and look, looking back and seeing that you know the UK Australia Holland and the US all investigated this in the 80s and found no single case of a sacrificed baby, despite hundreds and hundreds of reports, as I say. Mm. Yeah, it was uh, my series was Satan the Satanic Panic, the cult that never existed. Mm. Because usually I talk about cults that very much have existed. I just finished this month's episode looking at um the the Kirtland killings uh with jeffrey lundgren who splintered off from the rlds church um and yeah. ordered a blood atonement for for a, a family of five they're polygamous people. mormons for, for yeah oh so it was just a whole a whole thing um the satanic panic series but i am so i'm not so surprised anymore and um, especially uh when groups are like oh yes Horus and Set and Egyptology. At first, I was like, oh, my goodness, it's all the same stuff. But now if someone mentions Crowley, I'm like, yes, well, of course, he's in there somewhere. <laughs> and and the, the etiology of the contemporary groups is fascinating that, that um, as far as I can tell, we can get back to about 1800 BC uh, with the wow. mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries, and the techniques that they were using will then become basic to the Rosicrucians, to the Freemasons, and um, you know, the, you know, one of the essential aspects is the idea of um, resurrection, which became quite popular. And um, its start seems to be that, that you'd be taken through a series of initiations, told secrets, it, it erupts again in Gnosticism um, around the time of, of beginnings of christianity you know, some of the gnostic sects were not in fact christian but that's a, a very elaborate discussion and nearly 200 have been distinguished by scholars wow. um but there's an essential idea which is that when you die you'll have these passwords and you'll pass through the planets uh, which is of course the whole universe the, the planets at that time it's a very little place back then and you'll be able to to go and live with um god um if you've got the passwords right, you know, it's kind of shades of Mormonism there again. But this idea of special knowledge, they would call their uh, elders the electoi, the elect, and they are superior beings. We see this kind of Gnostic idea. Of, and the final thing will be that you'll be taken through your own death. And the way that you will be taken through it is you'll be taken somewhere dark, have the living daylight scared out of you, as in all good initiation rites, you know, bull roarers and when the Aborigines, <laughs> this kind of thing. And when you're scared enough and trembling enough, they'll put you in a coffin <laughs> and put lid on. And um, you'll have an incredible revelation about, you know, having survived death and everything will be wonderful. The, I, I'm just so immersed in this, you know, reading Machia Eliada and his histories of religion, um, Joseph Campbell. Um, to to find and and you know all sorts of Sufi and Taoist and Hindu and Buddhist texts over the years, to understand that there are only a certain number of ideas, there are only a certain number of directions you can go, and you can create a chart which is if this then that you know, and take people through. And once you started believing one thing, like for example, there's a supernatural presence that watches you all the time and is keeping account of your good and bad deeds and will exact retribution upon you, <laughs> once you've accepted that, you can live a fairly distressed life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, Armageddon. Don't, don't ever say the word Armageddon to anybody who's been around the Jehovah's Witnesses. Sends them scurrying. Even the apathy. It's, um, it, the, the, the idea of resurrection, I mean, I was finding my research because i hadn't looked into the rosicrucians and i hadn't looked really into the crusades um mm. but i realized that when i was doing some research into the order of the solar temple that mm. everything again was going back to madame blavatsky and her teachings and to, i had to kind of start with the order of the solar temple 
uh, whose group really fell apart in the 90s um, again so not yeah, committing that long suicide ago. doesn't keep a group going very well does it It doesn't it doesn't no um did you uh, get especially... into their, their links with gladio did you get into any of that stuff about the intelligence agencies that founded the order of the solar temple i didn't do too much of that stuff no. i i i had a lot of people ask me if i'd looked into the cia links with charles manson and when i started looking into that stuff i was like Oh, I don't know if that's the route I'm going to go down, but I mm. did find some really interesting doctrine that uh, Luke Charest had adopted based on the Great White Brotherhood. So I started reading up about the Great White Brotherhood and they believed that they were superior beings that were there to cleanse the earth. And, um, and then I started to look into... A lot of christian science uh because of the, the whole other resur- origins, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the resurrection the idea that that people um could heal ailments through prayer and through the power of thought i thought that was a really interesting concept so and then i found myself again i was like oh here's madame blavatsky and mm-hmm. she hangs out with alistair crowley all the time like um in texts uh, at least i'm not sure that they ever really cross paths in real I life believe they did. Um, <laughs> but there is a relationship in the ideas certainly yeah um, and it's and it's always interesting for me as a woman to come across influential women that have really shaped the way that new age movements work because even though there's still a, a very misogynistic viewpoint in fundamentalist and evangelical religious groups in Christianity. I mean, if we talk about some other major religions, we're going to come across the same themes in terms of male domination. But I thought that the the new age um, trend that happened with Madame Blavatsky and then Mary Baker Eddy kind of coming along with Christian science and being like, actually, this is how you should pray and and this is how you should practice religion i always find it interesting when there's a matriarch uh, because you don't really you don't tend to see that very often people talk so much about they talk so much about david koresh and jim jones but actually there are some women out there as well that should be uh, um, addressed as extremely problematic because their teachings still exist today and christian scientists I imagine die every day um, because of the, the the warped teachings of a woman that just wanted control and power. Mm. I don't know if she ever thought that her teachings would transcend generations, but I speak to former Christian scientists that left a few years ago and they're sort of second, third, fourth generation because their families have been involved for so long. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, there's also in the 19th century you have Ralph Waldo Trine, who's not much read anymore. And a book called In Tune with the Infinite, which I think predates both Eddie and Blavatsky. Wow. Um, but nonetheless, it's the same mix, which is now the law of attraction, the secret, wishing and hoping and praying and dreaming. And of course, I it do does have an not... and Yeah, it's it's appealing. I can see why it's appealing. I guess the modern version of, of something like that would be a group that Sharon Gans led uh, out of New York and Boston. It was a a, a secret group. They called themselves the school um, or the work, and they had no official title or no set location on where they would meet. And they the teachings were based off of Gajif. Um, but it's funny because it's Sharon he Gans... work because that's what he called it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But she would hand out. Um, well, no one really saw her for the first few years. She was pulling the strings from very much in the background. But there would be workbooks handed out to people with uh, retractions made, so you never could w- work out where the work came from. It was supposed to be kind of translated. Um, thoughts that came from Sharon Gans, but actually turned out that it was just completely plagiarized entire Gajif works that were just just kind of full of, of retractions everywhere. And I, I again think that that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and the, the, the way that, that, that these tributaries run, Ayn Rand is another of the matriarchal figures. And, and I think it's worth saying, I, I think the male female divide may obscure a certain perception. I, I think it's a good idea to look at things from different perceptions, and we have to look at misogyny, we have to look at male domination in societies, of course we do. 
and we have to bring an equality. But I think there is a problem that we might be bringing a division. We might be, it, it's sort of um, um, Mengele, the angel of death at um, Auschwitz, his son, who, uh, if I remember rightly, and Spike will look at this and tell me I'm wrong, no doubt. Um, his son was four years old when, about four years old when Mengele fled at the end of the war. And you have this situation where the son spent his life finding out about his father, making public the horrors of his father's life. And you go, well, was the son guilty of the father's crimes? Can we say, because my grandparents did this, I need to make reparation? And I think we're in a lot of trouble there. I think that, you know, I'm not a Marxist, I've never been in, involved with that, but Marx's point that history can be viewed as dialectic materialism, as a war between those who have and those who don't have, we must not forget. And so there is the gender differentiation, but there's also the class differentiation. There's also the idea of people who don't have to contribute anything to society and are pampered and preened by the rest of us. And I don't think we should push that. You know, it, it's important to look at that dynamic as well. Um, when we come to the, the etiology, the development, the evolution of, of groups, ideas have been put forward and you can trace them back. So if you look at um, look at Donald Trump and don't spend too long doing it, um, but look at Donald Trump. <laughs> and it, he, of course, went to church as a young boy at the church run by Norman Vincent Peale, a man who wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, and it, which is sold, I think it claims two million copies. Or 10 million copies, it's a huge amount. And here we have somebody who's saying, well, look, there's this doctrine of prayer in Christianity. Now, as I, you know, as I, I'm an agnostic, I'm not going to get into this, but as I recollect, Jesus says, you should say only one prayer, and that is, our Father that art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and not have the uh, vain repetitions of the heathens, I think is the expression. And then this comes to prosperity Christianity somehow, that, that you can, you know, demand a Mercedes Benz by um, praying to, 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 and it's sort of, I'm sorry, prayer. And, and I think prayer is a great idea. I, because I'm an agnostic, I don't do it. But I think it's a great idea to say, you know, God bless mummy and daddy and, and, and get into the idea of bringing good fortune to others healing the sick, you know, bringing consolation to the distressed. But a Mercedes Benz and a mega church, things have gone really... Have you, have you seen um, the Righteous Gemstones, speaking of which? No, I haven't. Oh, I haven't. Wonderful and brilliant. And finally, a comedy series about mega churches and what's really going on inside them, with John Goodman in it, who is always a, a special treat, you know, one way or another. But very... Yeah. Very funny and very sharp, written by you know people who understand the dynamics of these movements and the incredible hypocrisy, you know the the kind of Jimmy Swaggart um, hypocrisy that runs through so many of these groups, or, or people like you know Benny Hinn, and it puts us in this terrible situation that I mean Margaret Singer in writing Cults in Our Midst with Yanni Lelich. Um, she, she, I think she says in the book, but she said to me that that um, it's the title is because that's how we're all living. That yeah. they're just you know like Russian dolls, one cult within another, and it is a matter of how fervent those groups are, how controlling those groups are. But in society, you have to have certain set of laws and the. You know, the great evolution of our society, of Western society, is you know, looking back to, say, um, Charles Kingsley and the water babies in about 1870. Here is this, this terrifying novel for children. I read it when I was a kid about little chimney sweeps getting stuck up chimneys, you know, four and five year olds being sent up chimneys. And I think it is important to look back and say we have evolved through the legal process, we have changed society. However, we haven't actually got anywhere yet. You know, we haven't arrived at a perfect society, perhaps because 
we misunderstand what that would be. Um, and that's a sidetrack, but you know, for anybody who, who wants to think about that, uh, Graeber and Wengro, The Dawn of Everything, is an incredible book about there having been many different forms of human society, uh, which have been successful. And they've not, you know, for example, the, the Indus Valley, uh, the Harappan society in what is now Pakistan, which existed for 700 years without warfare. And we're not managing very well in those terms, you know, so, and they appear to have been egalitarian, democratic in, in the way they function. The Ukraine, before the madness started to descend there, there were archaeologists digging up another uh, proto-civilization that also seemed to be um, egalitarian. You know, it doesn't, they don't seem to have been um, kings and, and princes and, and all of that stuff. So, and the cults are the, you know, the model of society. How bad does it have to be? How far can we push people? Um, and looking back, you know, to, to looking at somebody like Ron Hubbard or Joseph Smith, there are models like Henry VIII. You know, you want to look at evil. You want to look at the horrors that one human being can commit. There he is. And he's at least he's the ancestor of our present king. You know, so that's something. I, first of all, I oh, just have no care for the royal family. And I know that that upsets some people, but I just don't understand it. it I just don't. We ha When I was born, we had a queen. We had that queen until recently. Um, and now we have a king. I don't understand it. I, do, I, I understand that sometimes when politicians can't make decisions, they might need to go and ask the king for things like I don't and you don't and know I whether could... to put marmalade on their toast or not you know is, is that what well, I, doing? it's so strange and then there's outcry and outrage about how many how many millions of taxpayers pounds go on lavish things birthdays and um you know and and all sorts of royal uh jamborees yeah, the, the I just I, anyway, it's it's a whole other world from anything that I've ever experienced or or know of growing up, and so I've not made an effort to really understand the royal family, the purpose, um, I, I and I understand a bit of of, of history from uh, what we are taught, but I do find it interesting that you mentioned L. Ron Hubbard and Joseph Smith, because I interviewed a person one time who was born into the LDS church. The Latter-day um, Saints Mormons, yeah. And she left in her 30s, and the, the history of the church, she was taught from the church's point of view, and that was all she ever knew. Mm -hmm. And when she left the church and began researching independently and finding out that there was this whole other version of Joseph Smith that she'd never heard of before with child brides and forced polygamy and magic rocks. Um, she was absolutely shocked and she thought it was so ridiculous that she didn't believe it for a number of years. She had to keep going and finding more evidence, more research, more things to support that she'd been told a completely different set of events than what I was told at school. I remember learning about Joseph Smith and, well, really about how Salt Lake City was able to become some place that wasn't habited to becoming, you know, a whole civilization. That's real, but, but we started by learning about Joseph Smith. I thought that was one of the most fascinating conversations I'd ever had because she's in her 30s and she's learning about a whole set of events that she had a completely different version of. Mm -hmm. And that uh, must be another kind of whiplash experience for an individual to to leave a group and find out that their entire reality is um, is neatly uh, is neatly kind of supporting what the LDS is trying to sell. Hmm. And and when we look at, at what is it the Springfield massacre, where um, uh, Brigham Young, who took over from uh, Smith, um, I mean eventually they gave up one of their number to the U.S. courts uh, over this, but but they, you know, it's this barbarous massacre that's performed by 
members of the Mormons. I, I only realized, you know, a few months ago that that when they went to Salt Lake City, it wasn't part of the United States. It was part of Mexico. And so it was I an did attempt not know to escape. that. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, just the territorial changes in the in the middle of the remember the Alamo. Yes, that's the time when we took a great big piece of Mexico from them. Wow. How dare they I just, believe it was there? I <laughs> thought it was just because it was barren and no one lived there. So they and and so nobody would try to to kick them out because who who would care? Well, they're um, in the wow, that's interesting. The northernmost part of Mexico, which was, you know, a, a fairly um, unstructured community, you might say that you know the rule of law. You, you'd had Mexico, you, Mexico was still removing itself from Spanish dominion, and it, yeah, vast territory with very few people in it, uh, including, of course, California. But it's it's quite fascinating, you know, contemporary. Um, white nationalists you know saying that they want to to send the hispanics back home and you're going have you noticed the names of of the towns in california san francisco los angeles you know that um la jolla which is difficult to spell um j-o-l-l-a um that that you've actually this is a place that was bought in 1847 this is not a traditional home of uh, white god-fearing christians this is in fact a spanish um, settlement um yeah and that you know what you say about the royal family let's let's look at that in terms of of cults that we off or, or your your friend who left the lds that, that the history as we have it and the reality history is a mississippi of lies and and a lot of propaganda uh, it isn't any more told by the victors, and I think that we have to it, we have to say that history, certainly since the end of the Second World War, has been open to everybody. And there is such a thing as scientific history, where we look back and find the documents from the time and say, "Oh my, <laughs> this is not what I was told." So when I was at school, I was taught about Good Queen Bess, Queen Elizabeth the First, wonderful woman, you know, resisted the Spanish Armada and and um, had the heart of a lion, I think it was, or something. And um, you then find that good Queen Bess, who was incredibly cultivated and spoke Greek, uh, we're told, but she spent more time with one of her court officials than any other. And that court official was her chief torturer. And you go, wow. so there might be a slightly romantic idea here. It was also a, a criminal offence to own a portrait of her other than the official portrait to the extent that you could be executed for having a picture of her that did not falsely depict her as this gorgeous woman, you know, that she'd actually was rattled and falling apart. So propaganda and public relations and history and advertising all kind of mixed together. And uh, you know, my work in the last 10 years or so has, has largely been focused no longer on recovery. And I've worked with probably about 600 former, largely former Scientologists in their recovery, um, in you know, in them taking back their lives, um, taking back control, as we learned in, in Brexit. What a brilliant slogan that is. <laughs> um, that, that I move from that towards prevention because, um, you know, uh, what is it, 28 grams of prevention is worth 454 grams of cure. We're getting metric now. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That recovery takes, and, and it varies from one person to another. Some people it takes a day. You know, Aaron Smith Levin tells me that he's never had to recover. He just walked out of Scientology and he's fine. But further on in the conversation, he was suggesting that Scientology has some good ideas in it. And I was kind of, name one, you know. And I wasn't satisfied with what he suggested. So recovery is that process of making ideas your own and deciding which bits might be useful to you from the group yep. you belong to. Yep. But it more usually is going to take years for people. And prevention takes an afternoon. And we don't teach any of it in our schools. No, no, we don't. We don't. And we could, I do hope we... that I do hope that there is change. I mean, oh, and especially when you consider 
all of the themes that are looked at in opening our minds and some of the things that I've been thinking about in my in my own mind in terms of where what other environments can we identify coercive control um which is where I've talked about the armed forces because I find I find the high demand setup of the armed forces especially in America really fascinating and I do feel like it's a blueprint that is used by author authoritarian destructive groups that take it a step further and say um here's how we're going to regiment ourselves and then we're going to cause harm to the people either inside or outside or both um so I've been thinking about gang culture I've been thinking about prison culture I've been thinking about advertising um, and how everybody is being influenced on some level um, and I've been thinking about intimate partnerships and and domestic violence and family relationships and how as you said it's like the Russian doll cults in our midst everywhere because once you start looking you really do begin to realize that coercive control exists in all aspects of everyday life yeah. um it's it's kind of trying to pick the right battles because it's impossible to it's impossible to work on all of that stuff but we can educate and we can um and we can have conversations and we can say okay well domestic abuse is something that is I mean, you can you can look at that and you can identify it and there are measures and things that you can put in place. I don't know I could tackle Amazon. I mean, I'd love to, but and I know that they have all sorts of partnerships with government where devices listen in and information is sold back and that's public knowledge. That's I know that sounds yeah. a bit kind of conspiracy theory of oh, me. I, I don't but... use I don't use Alexa, Siri, Cortana, any of those things because I I don't want a microphone in my house. I, I wrote a piece oh, about seven years ago called Little Sister is Listening to You, as opposed to Big Brother is Watching You. And yeah, there was a murder case where um, files were demanded because there was a recording of a murder. Now, that's great that they were able to catch a murderer. But the problem that when the state can say, you know, bit like this, when Snowden came out and said, oh, they can switch your mobile phone on and listen to you. It's like, oh, no. You, know, you have a little tape over your computer camera, you know, to make sure that um, that's not going on. We have moved, we've moved beyond 1984. I, I, I'm a big fan of Aldous Huxley's um, Brave New World. And he wrote a, a book called Brave New World Revisited in uh, 1954, so he's six years, uh, Brave New World's 1932, I think. Um, six years after 1984 is published and he was mates with George Orwell, Eric Blair, who's dead by this time. But six years later, he crows about how right he was and how wrong Orwell was, that the way you run this society is through SOMA. It's through making people think, and as soon as Prozac started, and there is in fact a drug called SOMA, but as soon as Prozac started, you know, taking over in the late 80s. And we are now yet again faced with the reality that we don't know what serotonin is and we don't, you know, this whole explanation of serotonin reuptake, it, it's a, a fantasy. It's never been proven. What does seem to be happening is neurogenesis in the hippocampus if you take this drug. We don't know why. But the problem is you have a society that is medicated. And that's exactly what Huxley was talking about. And we have, you know, in his comparison, he, he shows that rather than imposing this thing and forcing people to do things, and, and Orwell was very open, he was talking about Stalinism. Um, and, you know, what, what would also, you know, the, that other form of Stalinism, Maoism, um, you know, bearing in mind that, that the Chinese communists were wholly and totally funded by Stalin. That their whole progress, their whole all of the military hardware they had was all from Russia. Um, they they funded the other side too, the Kuomintang, just to be sure. You know. But the, 
the, the situation, the worst situation is where people really think that going on Amazon and buying a lot of crap from China is somehow good for them or beneficial. That we've, we've created a kind of junky society where rather than taking real pleasure and delight in the world, and there is so much out there to take pleasure and delight in, people have become, become consumers. They've become attached to uh, a dogma and they are trying to appease their disappointment <laughs> you know and i've said it often enough but by the time the package arrives from amazon you're online after the next one you know it's like you want the next hit you know i'm bored with that now already and i've only just unwrapped it and we are inducing that on the other side going back to the idea of, of the military and i agree with you that we have to look at uh, religious orders particularly powerful groups like opus day which are dreadful cults uh, and the idea that the founder of Opus Dei is a saint now, according to the Catholic Church, is very worrisome to me. We have to look at all of the institutions and structures in our society. But I have some good news. Um, one of my oldest and closest friends is, is Ira Chalaf, uh, who wrote Intelligent Disobedience, which absolutely everybody should read. It's a brilliant book. And who initiated the movement called Courageous Followership back in the 80s. And um, Ira's work has been adopted at Sandhurst and it's been adopted by the US military. Um, and indeed, recently the civilian arm of the US military, which employs 300,000 people, have come to him and said, we want to teach courageous followership. So that it's not just that you won't follow an order because it's illegal, it's that you won't follow an order because it's immoral. So. I think, you know, just as we don't tend to send four-year-olds up chimneys anymore, and there are people who think it's a bad idea, that there is a social move away from the more draconian behaviours. Um, sadly, you know, we have Russia and Ukraine at the same time, but um, it, it, what, what will happen, you know, we as the human race will survive uh, only if we main protect our environment, which we're not doing tremendously well. So again, we've got rewilding all over the world. You know, it's not far from being negative, but we won't do that unless we stop fighting wars. And we won't stop fighting wars until people can understand the difference between propaganda and reality. And here we're going to link all the way back to the royal family. I was fascinated because friends of mine were saying nasty things about Harry and Meghan. And everybody I talked to said nasty things about them. So I went, oh, I'm going to watch this Netflix documentary. Let's see. And I said to um, a young friend that, that having watched it, the thing that, that first struck me was these were two very smart people. And she went, really? And, you know, <laughs> ridiculous idea. I talked to another friend and he, who's a dentist, in fact, and he said, yeah, she's an actress. It's like. So I said, oh, you mean as in prostitute, you know, the, the old fashioned idea of actors all being so we can dismiss them. Why is that relevant? And you look at these people and they have exposed the royal family as a cult. And there's a differentiation I think we can make, which is that what's pouring out of Kensington House is propaganda. Yeah. that They are seeking to create a view. And what Harry and Meghan have done in response is public relations that they've said, here are, here's the information, check it out for yourself. And you find two people who have in fact spent their lives doing charitable works. Um, you know, Meghan Markle had been to India and Africa before she met Harry and they're very concerned. And they started doing, I thought the tour in South Africa and I am not a royalist. I do not believe in this idea. It's, it's an anachronism. It's an ancient cult that, <laughs> you know, that's my view. But it can have a positive value. We don't have to destroy it. I, I, was in, uh, I was in Cape Town and many years ago and a, and a friend said it was a terrible thing that, that the native peoples were, were losing their traditions. And it, the thought had never struck me. I, I went, so you reckon that all English people should do Morris dancing? You know, why shouldn't they have the choice to say we don't want to do this? And all of these bloody, you know, going and seeing the Lakota people performing the Sundance for tourists. It's like, 
maintaining our traditions in Disney World, you know, so there has to be some other view. And with the royal family, I think what's happened because of Spare and, and, and the documentary is that the whole, the British media has been challenged and it's been said, you are scurrilous, <laughs> you know, you are thoroughly, you know, what was it the Times said of Harry and Meghan when she wouldn't present baby on the first day, refused to do this. They said, we pay, you perform, something like that. And they've stood up and they've exposed the British media for just a rag bag of you know, horror that, that there is virtually no decent investigative journalism left in the British media. And that's collapsed 30 years ago. That, that was already it used to be, you know, like Spotlight at the Boston Globe that exposed Catholic um, sexual abuse, abuse by priests. That was an investigation that took somewhere over a year. Nowadays, you get three days to investigate a story. So yeah. there's very little of it. And then you get Bellingcat and all of, all of these good things. Um, but we we have a situation where they've exposed the media, but they've also said, why have we got a royal family? And in a democracy, and I'm told we live in one, we should really be discussing that. Yes, they in 2011, the royal family assigned all of its revenues to the state. So all the money that comes in from the palaces goes to the state. The deal was all their expenses are paid. And as you say, they have big parties, you know. Yeah, no doubt. I understand that the tourism, uh, you know, other countries kind of have this, especially over in America, have this idea of the royal family and collect memorabilia and have, you know, cupboards full of plates with the queen's face on. So I understand that there is a revenue that is generated from having a royal family. I'm not sure you could look at those things and and really kind of, you know, one one outweighs the other, uh, I imagine, in, in some senses. Um, and I have found the whole kind of, royal family and Harry and Meghan thing interesting in itself because when we look at the us versus them ideas of 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 groups of cults high demand groups there's there's often um an unspoken divide inside groups so in the Jehovah's Witnesses for example if you are somebody that's been disfellowshipped and then reinstated there's a chance that you will be treated differently by your brothers and sisters as some of the more devoted, pure Jehovah's Witnesses might be treated by and elders. These people supposedly believe in rehabilitation and redemption, but not really. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, and, you know, just love above all and Je the love for Jehovah. And um, so it's interesting then when you have this kind of exposed divide, this exposed us versus them that's been happening internally for a very long time in a closed off system like the royal family. Um, and now everybody is kind of, everyone in the public is privy to at least what the media wants us to see of of um, that divide. And, um, and it's interesting how some people you've spoken to have jumped straight into the defense of the royal family and, and less in support of, 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 of Harry and, and Meghan Markle, because I have not read too much about it. I've seen some, some pretty questionable headlines and some pretty vulgar statements by people like Jeremy Clarkson. Uh, but, all the uh, statements you, by Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah, oh my goodness. Um, how out of character. <laughs> I, I think that it's, it's if people want to speak out, I think that's their right. And I don't know why I get the feeling that a lot of people's like resentment and anger towards the couple is that they're exercising that right to speak out publicly. Like how dare they tell their side of the story? I feel like that's where a lot of the, um, a lot of the anger is coming from. So that's kind of what makes me a little bit like, this is nothing to do with me. Um, I understand that there is probably some things that are happening inside this system that negatively impact society in the UK and maybe even further afield as a whole but um, I don't know that I need to spend so much of my personal time invested in learning the ins and outs of of Harry and Meg Meghan's battle against you know Harry's brother and the rest of the family um, if there was some substantial stuff that came out on how the public are being impacted by this 
archaic thing that exists in our country, then I might be a bit more inclined to say, oh, how can I learn about this? How can I recognize it in other systems? How can we say, oh, that looks very similar to what happened with the royal family? And we know how much the 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 racism um and the the infighting damaged these individuals who have written these autobiographies but right now as it stands i feel like there are so many other things that we can be looking at like large group awareness training in the uk this is something that is in in impacting the, the most vulnerable people that can be picked up off of the streets i don't think that an individual is going to be um you know, stopped by a group of people uh, who who say, oh my goodness, that's such a beautiful coat. Oh, I love your bag. Do you want to come for a uh, coffee with us? We'd love to Let's treat you to king. coffee. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't feel like I'm going to be invited into the royal family anytime soon, but I do feel like I could be picked up off the street to be uh, invited to something like large group awareness training. I'm... So that's my really big way of kind of saying like, I think there's a problem with the royal family, but I feel like there are other problems that um, are maybe more applicable to where I am stationed in life. <laughs> I, well, firstly, I think it's edutainment. And um, if, if you're watching... Edutainment, watch... yes, that's a great word. <laughs> if, if you're watching that instead of Breaking Bad, then, you know, um, you are... There is information in there. The second thing is it's the lens through which we see. And... To look at society and the ills of society, you know, yeah, I mean, if we want to look at the, you know, the most dreadful things, you have things like the new Kadampa tradition. And um, I, I talked with Michelle Haslam, who has two PhDs. I mean, what a show off um, in psychology <laughs> and yet was pulled into this group. So that is fascinating of, in and of itself. And she alleges that they take in homeless people. And because they're a tantric group, they have sex with them as part of their religion. That they've right. been endorsed by one of the Leicester universities. Uh, they sell mindfulness, which is something that does bother me rather in this world. And I'm pro meditation, but I think you need to know that if you have, if you're anxious and you don't exercise, then you can get about 40% of people relaxation induced anxiety. And the cra some of the craziest people I've ever met were hardcore meditators, some of the most anxious people. And that that's not really talked about. I mean, I, I write letters to new scientists and they, they've printed seven or eight over the years. I've, you know, I've been subscribing for 30 years, so it's not that great. <laughs> but whenever I write to them about mindfulness and point out statistics, amounts of money, you know, the National Institutes of Health have spent $110 million up to about four years ago to try and show that mindfulness is good for us, as yet they haven't managed. And yet Oxford University is giving a course in mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which Ruby Wax has endorsed. And, and when a manic depressive tells you something's good, you've got to believe them. Um, there, there are so many subjects and there's so many ways in. And, and I think that all aspects of society are open to this based upon Firstly, your interest, if you're not interested in it, then heck, who cares? Go and watch Breaking Bad. It's very gory, though, I must say. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've just finished watching it finally. Um, and, you know, so how we occupy our time and some people play video games. Some people read, you know, Harry Windsor's book about his life. And the lens, I can look at anything and see uh, how it fits into the pattern, you know, that so video games, for example, somebody just mentioned video games. We have this situation where I, I wrote a novel, which I haven't published. I wrote it I don't know, about 20 years ago, um, which is about a video game. And the character realizes that video game is being used to change his way of thinking. And oh, yes, this is happening in the real world. A lot of it very accidental, you know, Grand Theft Auto 3 is, I'm not sure, is tremendously good for people, you know, uh, the catharsis they achieve. But we could look at horror movies and say, you know, how much is the shape of water influence society? What is it that's happening to us? We live in a hierarchical society where there are authoritarians in charge. What does that say about the royal family? Can we understand something about you know, why do we have this love? 
for these people who are, forgive me, completely irrelevant. You know, but uh, it mustn't say that, <laughs> you know, Charles III has got lovely ears. How dare you? So seeing, you know, here we are in a society that is a constitutional monarchy. It's going, oh, are you saying it's a cult of some kind? And it's like, you know, is Prince William in a cult? Yes, he is. You know, I, I gave a talk at Eton in March, which was in, last March. It was incredible. You know, it came out of nowhere. That I'm asked to talk to the journalism. And what an incredible place. And you go there and you go, how often can you say this is the most prestigious school in the world? 21 prime ministers, is it now? And you go there and it's all covered in graffiti. Thousands and thousands of names carved into the panelling. Um, by the look of it, by professional wood carvers. You know, I mean, these kids can actually hire somebody to carve their name. It's like when I was a kid, we had to carve our own names or the names of kids we wanted to be punished into the desks. Um, and you've got Prince William and Prince Harry both there and they're higher up than anybody else and very beautifully carved, you know. And it was just this sense of, to understand authoritarianism, how is it that people who spend, get this, 42,000 pounds a year for five years to put their kids through Eton, where is our society? Now, I have to say, it was a friend of mine who has a kid in Eton who got me the invitation. I'd like to thank him very much, very publicly for that. <laughs> and I, I think it's probably a good use of his money because I think it's it's a very interesting place to be educated and not, as we would presume, it's not an authoritarian environment from, from my experience of it, or it's no worse than our other schools, let's put it that way. And that leads me all the way back, which is that our school system is authoritarian. And and it need not be, you know, as say Ira Chalef's book, Intelligent Disobedience, which you know, he was giving a talk one day and a, and a, and a woman in, in the class said, uh, I have an example of what you're talking about under the desk. And he said, I'm sorry. And she brought <laughs> out a guide dog that she was training. He said, this guide dog with a blind person, if the blind person's about to walk into something, they have to say no. We call this intelligent disobedience. Why don't we teach our kids? Why are we teaching our kids obedience? Do do what I tell you to do. Why aren't we yeah. saying, yeah, he's got a little video um, called Blink Think, which you can find just by those um, choice voice, Blink Think choice voice, you'll find it with that. Just a few minutes for parents saying, you know, you tell your five-year-old, if somebody asks you to do something, blink, take a moment, think. Make a choice about whether you think you should do it and then voice that choice. Say, no, that sounds like a daft idea. What kind of sweets are they anyway? And if I get into the back of the van, you know, that we should be offering um, critical thinking, if you like, not a term I use a lot, but we should be offering logic and rationality to our children to be saying, you know, and our soldiers and everybody to be saying, I'm not going to do that because it's a bloody stupid idea. And, I, you know, I'm very optimistic. Most, most of the people I know aren't. Most of the people I know who are working professionally with former cult members, when you sit with them in private, are despondent because the world is now packed with all of this nonsense. Yeah. I think we have the tools to change this. And it's, it's down to just one thing. It's down to people picking those tools up and using them. It's yeah. not... Thankfully, it's not down to them following me, though, you know, all money is gratefully accepted and praised. <laughs> but it, it's about people working things out, thinking things through and coming to their own decisions and understanding the extent to which our decisions are affected by the, the nonsense of the press, you know, and the, the pundits that, that we listen to, um, you know, the Alex Jones and the, these truly awful people um, who make material up, you know, Rush, Rush Limbaugh, who <laughs> just made up whatever he wanted. And um, we have to, you know, like, so the, I'm trying, at the moment I'm working on a course on fake news, uh, propaganda and advertising, which is for the UK curriculum. Nobody's commissioned wow. me to do this, but we can offer it free of charge and schools can decide if they want to put it into their 
um, personal, social, health and economic education or not. And it kind of came, why hasn't anybody done this yet? Because yeah. we've had all this talk about fake news. Well, how can you tell whether it's fake? I, I went to Anthony Prakarnis, who's a celebrated and brilliant psychologist, social psychologist, and said, um, he was on the board of a, a thing that I was involved with. And um, I, I gave him the, the points made by the Institute for Propaganda Analysis in 1938. Very hopeful that he would say, oh, that's so old fashioned, John, here, try this. And he came back and he said, yeah, they're brilliant. Oh. Yes. Since 1938, we've had this guideline, which you can find on Wikipedia, it's everywhere, and we don't use it. So showing, pe showing kids how to look at an advertisement and understand that you're being deceived, you're being lured. You know, one of my favorite things was finding out that um, Taylor Swift and, and bless her, you know, the, the world's most polluting human being, we're told, because of her jet airplanes. Um, but she's a great songwriter, not, not my kind of thing, really. But, you know, she's obviously good at what she does. But she was paid um, $26 million by Coca Cola so they could use her image for one year. That's half a million dollars a week. And to anybody who's oh, watching this who's drinking Coke, you're paying for that. <laughs> so, that yeah. is wild. That is wild. And and I I see kind of why prevention is the next natural step for your work, especially yeah. when you say you've been looking into this stuff for 40 years. Uh, there has to come a point where you think, what's what what's my legacy? You have so much published literature, but also then to be able to have programs that are ready to be implemented into schools for real, you know, if nobody picks up a book, nobody pick, you know, it, it, it some some people just don't don't read. It's not it's their you know not their choice. They don't listen to my audio books either. So, audio books yeah and then if you're in school and you just have one of these lessons that could be you know that could be the fuel to to to, to change somebody's interest or to be like oh do you know what I'm not sure I want to come to your chess club sounds a bit dodgy <laughs> yeah and it, it 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 amazes me having been around the counter cot world for, for four decades and I've never belonged to any of the organizations within it um, I have, you know, close friendships with um, Christian Cherko, who who I think is the most eminent recovery counsellor in the world. And, you know, Rachel Bernstein's a good friend in LA. Um, Pat Ryan, Joe Kelly, Joe Zimhart, lots of, you know, the Pit Point Richards, the people you find on my channel, basically. Um, and they, they are so overwhelmed because there are so few people doing this. And there are people among us who are infighting and making it harder. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is never good. Not mentioning Deborah Van Nest or any of these people. I, I'm <laughs> late Kathleen Mann, I, I won't mention them. Um, but th there's so there's not the time to then say we need to do something. And there's, I think the political will is beginning to happen after Jamie Raskin, who was a representative in the US. Uh, federal representative in the House. Um, he was on the January 6th committee and he went and talked with Steve Hassan for a couple of hours. And he made a public statement afterwards that it was time to deprogram the Republican Party. And I agree with him, though I think the term deprogramming is insulting to human beings. But putting that aside, I, I, I get what he was trying to say. But it's time to deprogram society. It, it's time to to look at the things that are accepted as normal, the, the, the ideas we worship, the, the, the people that, that we kowtow before, and, mm -hmm. and say, well, maybe doing what John Travolta and Tom Cruise do isn't a good idea, you know, hasn't done them any good. Um, and, you know, change the status thing, because authoritarianism is there up there and I'm down here, and say, no, we actually are factually all equal. You know, yep. um, you know yep. we all have our talents. We all have our, our disabling, disabling aspects of, of ourselves. But but we are all contributors to humanity. And I think 
that that's coming through scientifically. I think that the work that's been done on evolution in the last 25 years, dismissing Richard Dawkins' selfish gene nonsense and saying, actually, it's so much more subtle than that, that everything you do is potentially changing your genes. And in fact, it is. You know, genes are not read only, as my friend Yuval Laor puts it. We're writing on them all the time. We're changing our own DNA and and what we pass on. And that's much better than the kind of robotic billiard balls being banged around idea, which, which has dominated so much because it allows us all to be participants um, in humanity and, and to become humane, which would be would be rather good, I think. Mm. Really yeah, nice. yeah. And in kind of, well, just some, some last thoughts that I had on, on some of the things that you've mentioned. In terms of um, looking at whether the royal family is a cult, I always, when people say to me, is this a cult? I always just say, how easy is it for an individual to leave? Because if that brings up questions of kind wow. of... <laughs> Yeah. How, uh, how, was, yeah, how easy is it for a person to leave? Because if someone can walk away and there's no repercussions, whether yeah. that's financially or familiarly with your, you know, community and family members, I think that 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 is a pretty easy, well, not easy, but I think it's a fast way of saying, oh, okay, this group's problematic, you know, because yes. everything that I have in my life, my entire identity or belief system or anything is all wrapped up in this one group. And will they still talk to me after I leave? That's the next So part. if you look yeah. at Harry and Meghan and you say, how easy is it for them to leave, even if it was quietly and they decided not to speak out? And I think maybe part of their decision might have been because it was made so difficult for them to be like, we're taking the kids and we're moving out of the country. Um, so there is there is kind of that. I, you know, when people say to me, do you think the royal family is a cult? I would just say, well, how easy is it for somebody to leave? Mm. Um, and in terms of what I thought about your section in opening our minds about educating children in school, I remember when I did my course at the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts and I was looking at uh, the work of Augustus Boal and we were looking at facilitation over learning. So instead of this concept of children being empty vessels to be filled up with the information of the teacher, one plus one equals two. Yes, that is the equation and that is the answer, but not everything in life is gonna be as simple as something plus something equals something. There's gonna be things that children have to learn the answers to on their own. So facilitation over dumping information into empty vessels is always something that I think I'm gonna be um, hopeful for allowing children the opportunity to arrive at decisions or answers on their own and then having a discussion over you know if there is a definitive answer if that's not the answer the child's arrived at how do we have a discussion on kind of talking about why the answer isn't the correct answer if it's not a definitive answer I think it's okay for the children's answers to be different than the teacher's answers. And if there was any, and I know that facilitation is takes so much time um, and we don't have a lot of that in our current school structures. Um, we, there's not a lot of freedom because of all of the exams and, and stuff that, that the, the kids have and to go through. Let's get rid of exams. Play. Let's get rid of exams. I mean, it's if we didn't awesome. have that, if we didn't have that system, then there would be scope for facilitation in schools. I think. Um, so they were just some some thoughts that I had over the the restrictions that we have in in our education system and how there is scope to implement courses around, you know, manipulation and and recognizing the signs of of con artistry, which again, you know, coercive control one hundred and one. If you want to look at how somebody can be conned out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's exactly the same as how a person can be, you know, indoctrinated, brainwashed, uh, whatever words people would like to use in into a coercive uh, cultic group. Yeah. And so um, I think that everybody should read Opening Our Minds because there were so many things you talked about. And I need to go and read all of Alan Shefflin's work because I, I think, um, yeah, everything that, that you talked about with his work as well is extremely prevalent in our day and age, especially with children and technology. So 
Mm. Um, so many thoughts after reading that book. It's it's a wonderful read. So thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, Alan Cheflin's social influence model, I, I went to Alan uh, to see if he'd write an introduction for me. And um, we've become fast friends in the last few years, largely because he knew Eric Clapton and Paul McCartney and various people. And in fact, tried to get them to form a band after Cream split up in November 68 with Roy Buchanan, wow. who's a great guitar player, friend of his, and Ringo Starr on drums. But so, you know, we have it, we ended up, the only video we've done is about that. Um, but the That's social interested influence. though, and it's funny, I was just talking about the Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts. That's Paul McCartney's school. So with cults, everything cult. comes full circle and everything intertwines. It's actually quite scary. <laughs> but Alan, when I, I, I sent him the, the draft of the book and, and it had, uh, in fact, pretty much the finished book, and it had his social influence model as an appendix. And he said, where did you get this from? And I said, it's your published paper. He said, it's awful. <laughs> And he rewrote it. And so as far as I know, I've just done some work on a chapter that Alan and Steve Hassan have done together on the dark side of hypnosis. And in there, I've had to say, actually, the reference you're giving to the social influence model, the only place it's published is in my book. It's in your book, yeah, in the appendix. Just, That's so funny. <laughs> just going to put it up on Steve Hassan's site. On education, um, yeah, notion of uh, we force knowledge into you or we are a community of learning and which is beautifully expressed by Matthew Lipman um, known for the Socrates for six-year-olds program and Ken Robinson's books showing that hundreds of schools around the world have pushed away this kind of neoliberal stat keeping model where you know teachers are bored to death every year because Oh God, it's Macbeth again, you know. Um, and there's no discussion, there's no breadth to what they're doing. I had some period of home education with all four of my my kids. And we got into this thing with with the, the youngest two, who are now 18 and 20, and both are on music degrees in, in different universities. Um, that I was going to meetings, you know, before finally with my son Sam just taking him out of school pretty much because it wasn't working. And I was being told again and again that you had to jump through hoops. This expression was used so many times by teachers and educational psychologists that you had to jump through the hoops and then, and I, so I eventually sat in a room, I had four teachers, one of them a deputy head and a psychologist. And I said, so when do they get an education? You know, how many hoops is that at the PhD level or, you know, when does this happen? Because <laughs> what we've got is something pretty much like the Mandarin system that ended, you know, when the Kuomintang took over the nationalist, you know, the nationalist government took over in China. That it's it's all pretense. And the exam system, just one final point, because I have another call to go to and I'm sure you do. Um, <laughs> the exam system, the PISA tables taken every two years of all of the countries in the western world and into asia you know i think there are 170 contributing countries every two years finland comes top of the literacy tables they have one exam in their whole education at the end you do one exam and it's all about, it's like in the wire where you've got probilski and and they're, they're they're teaching the kids the answers to the sats they've got no idea what any of it means that's where we've arrived and that's exactly the brave new world society where and it it's on its way out what can i say that there's enough push now to to change the world and uh, yeah. it's just a matter of climbing on board and being part of that that's yeah well i mean as a competitive nation who strives to be alongside the other leading countries in the world you know however you define leading um i think that if they're doing one exam in another country and they're at the top of the the scoreboards i think you know that enough is a, it, it should be encouraging politicians to think how can we get to the top we want to be at the top too so even if that's the encouragement that they need like wonderful <laughs> they also have a higher per capita income than i think there's only switzerland that competes with them in europe 
Um, Very good quality of life in Scandinavia, crime rates. No um, homelessness in Finland. They decide they just went, right, okay, we're going to accommodate everybody. So everybody's got their own little place to live. So, you know, it's a bit cold there, though, in the winter. So I'm not, yeah. I'm not moving there yet. Yeah. And some conspiracy theorists uh, believe that Finland doesn't actually exist as well. So there is that to take into consideration. Yeah, you do have to be careful about that, don't you? And that, of course, Hitler is still alive under the South Pole. Yeah. And, um, and uh, JFK and his son are returning very soon to the streets of Dallas, Texas. So minute. there's a lot of stuff that's happening and uh, I'm excited for all of it. <laughs> it's great. Wonderful talking with you. And uh, Thank you so much, John. I've really appreciated this discussion and I've made so many notes of more things to go and read. So you are just a plethora of information and uh, I could just, yeah, I'm here for it every day. <laughs> Well, well we'll talk again in in a month or two and uh, and and see what we've caught up on with our yeah, reading. Yeah, fantastic. Great. I'd love that. Thank you so much John. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye. <laughs> Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like as well as subscribe and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much.